Hey, this is Joe Crane, host of Veteran on the Move podcast. And when I'm not helping veterans transition to entrepreneurship, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today we're learning about invisibility, awesome, breaking the laws of physics, sign me up. What, that, that's not what today's show is about? Oh, yeah, all right. Well, so it turns out uh, it, some hotshot named Roman Mars from some Radiotopia podcast called 99% Invisible is joining us to talk about the 99% Invisible City. And how much money is wrapped up in your community design? Uh, turns out there's a lot you never notice. In other news, when are you liable for your pet? You're in for a really unfortunate horror story about a pet, a thrown ball, and a lawsuit. We'll break it down for you during our headline segment. And finally, we'll save time to toss out the Haven Lifeline to our new trucker friend, August, who has a question about contributing to his workplace Roth 401k versus his Roth IRA. And of course, I'll delight you with a dose of my amazing trivia. And now, two guys who like to play a little game called Let's Pretend Doug is 99% of Visible, and it's not funny. It's Joe and O J J J J G. That's the best game we can play today. We don't see that guy over there in the corner with the microphone. If I close my eyes, they won't see me. <laughs> there's, there's nothing better than getting Doug riled up on a Wednesday. Hey, everybody! Speaking of Wednesday, welcome back to the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe Salci. So Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter, and not the fake OG on Twitter, sitting across from me right now, man. It is Hump Day, and uh, we got Roman Mars here today, my friend. Your favorite podcaster. He's in my top thousand. <laughs> Mom said you shouldn't have favorites. Roman Mars, definitely my favorite. And for people that uh, have liked some of the changes to the show. I can single-handedly say it was Roman Mars giving a yep. speech at a podcast movement. How long did it take me to tell you what, what I wanted to do that day? Like four hours, I think it took me to kind of explain the craziness. You were texting me during it. It was just, it was so eye-opening. But that guy's voice, this is 99% invisible. I'm Roman Mars. So good. That's coming up. But first... One quick thing, our friend Belinda Rosenblum has a course. If you need to get your financial foundation together, we've got our Making Money Easy course. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash easy and sign up. You can avoid the holiday hangover. If you want to know more about it, go back and listen to Friday's show. Belinda was on talking about that. Uh, but you've only got two days left until we shut her down. Stackingbenjamins.com forward slash easy. Roman Mars is here. But first, OG and I have some headlines, so let's get started. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins headlines. Our first headline comes to us from NBC News. This one's going to shock you, OG. U.S. seizes over $1 billion in Bitcoin tied to Silk Road. Did you see this? I did. Yes. <laughs> yes. As a matter of fact, I was following along the whole Bitcoin thing, because there was a lot of speculation going on about like, hey, somebody just removed a billion dollars from a Bitcoin wallet <laughs> that's been sitting there for for ages. What happened? And then it came out that the government seized it, which is kind of defeats the purpose of Bitcoin. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that message, if that message is exactly what they're trying to pretend. But uh, yeah, the whole thing about being uh, beyond government intervention. Maybe not. U.S. Justice mm -hmm. Department, uh, Reuters, uh, by the way, is the source of this. The U.S. Justice Department announced Thursday of last week it had seized over $1 billion worth of Bitcoin associated with the underground online marketplace Silk Road. Justice Department said it was seeking the forfeiture of the cryptocurrency, which had been in the possession of an unnamed hacker who stole them from the notorious, in quotes, website. 
It's the largest cryptocurrency seizure ever made by the U.S. government, the department added. Government will now try to prove in court the items are subject to forfeiture. In the past, the government has later auctioned off forfeited cryptocurrency. They don't get to keep that and solve the student loan crisis, maybe clean up the debt. Maybe. That's the thing that kind of is a little frustrating, right? That sentence that's before that that said, now they're trying to prove why they need it. Right. Like, hey, we're we gonna- took your crap. <laughs> And now we're going to prove that we're supposed to have it. It's like, wait a second. Shouldn't you have to prove it first? I think it, I think it might not work that way. That may not work the way you think it works. Yeah. This is just another reminder, though, OG, that even though cryptos are being used more and more often in society, still the Wild West, my friend. It is still the Wild Wild West out there. I want to know what kind of crappy hacker stole it and then never actually used it. Well, they can't use it because if they... If they paid for it with something and exchange it to a currency, then they run into a problem with their philosophy, right? I mean, isn't it supposed to be beyond other currencies? I'm just saying like, so they said that some hacker stole it from this other guy who was a criminal. Yes. Right. So the criminal B stole it from criminal A and then criminal C, the U.S. government stole it from criminal B, allegedly, but they need it but they got to prove that they're supposed to have anyway. So criminal B has it. How does criminal B not go like, cool, I got a billion dollars. I'm buying an airplane in an island. What if it's like Brewster's billions and he already did buy the airplane in the island. There's still a billion dollars left. Yeah. Well, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he forgot. Maybe he, maybe it was on like a computer and he forgot about it. Silk road. Like those people that, uh, you know, that used to buy Domino's pizzas with, Hundreds of bitcoins at a time, when it was like worth several pennies or several dollars, and <laughs> yeah, there all the all the rage was going to the landfills to like root through all the old computers to like plug in all the old hard drives because some idiots got you know sixteen thousand bitcoin, not realizing that it was that guy you know, in Ireland we talked about this spring. Remember where he his uh, his landlord after he went to jail threw out his stuff, including the the USB fob that had a uh, hundred million dollars worth of crypto, yeah. I think on it, something like that. Okay. And it's, and it's in a landfill in China. Yep. Good times. Finding it. Silk Road, by the way, was seized by the U S government in 2013, which is why they think they're able to do it with officials describing the underground website as a massive illegal and money laundering marketplace. And that's all. The website's accused creator, Russ Albrecht, was convicted in 2015 of seven counts of enabling illegal drug sales via Bitcoin, sentenced to life in prison, lost an attempted appeal back in 2017. Uh, The Bitcoin saga continues. You get into Bitcoin, I think there's still going to be, there's going to be more and more of this. Governments meet crypto. Who knows? In our second headline, let's go from cryptocurrency news to uh, celebrity news. Were you a fan of Kiss back in the day? Uh, No. No? You seem like you would have had all the Kiss posters on your wall and been doing the thing with your tongue. Gene Simmons thing. No? No Kiss posters at uh, no G's bedroom. So disappointing. Uh, This comes to us from Forbes, written by Keith Flamer. Rock legend Gene Simmons kisses his California state in high taxes goodbye. I wanted to ask you about this by way of, does it make sense to move from one state to another state just because of taxes? What if you like your neighbors? You like your neighborhood? You like your lifestyle? This is a Hall of Famer rocker, Gene Simmons, kissing his sentimental home of 36 years goodbye. The tongue-taunting, fire-breathing kiss bassist unloading his palatial Benedict Canyon estate with a catch. $22 million ask price and a personal meeting with the next owner to ensure that his homestead's left in good hands. Why, why do you want to meet the new owner? I know people who had that as they're like, like, let me show you how great this house. It's like, dude, get out. Yes. Like, we've exchanged all the, that's required to make this thing a legal outcome. I gave you cash. You gave me the keys. Get out of here. Don't bad mouth my dogs playing poker posters. Do yeah, not. I'm, I'm, trust me. I'm ripping your floors out of here. Cause they crap. The Velvet Elvis, I'm bringing that in. Mm-hmm. Simmons won't just sell to anybody. His majestic Beverly Hills area mansion represents a life well lived and loved. He'll leave behind fond family memories and a part of himself. Oh my goodness, really? So unlike most celebrities who fade into the background, Simmons will be intimately involved. Oh boy. What a great sales process. 
the piece, by the way, which we'll link to in our show notes page goes over how they remodeled the house and made it their own. It is a absolutely beautiful house. Why move now? Simmons picks a bass guitar, but the outspoken musician is emphatically finished taking licks from California's excessive taxes, which left him quote somewhere between heaven and hell to quote a kiss song. Simmons is relocating. He's instead moving to Washington state and lower taxes, a 24 acre state in the shadow of gorgeous Mount Rainier. Except you won't see the shadow because there's so many clouds <laughs> around <laughs> Mount Rainier. Uh, he'll just have to assume that he's in the shadow of Mount Rainier. He's like, every time Cheryl and I go to, to Seattle, I'm like, yeah, Mount Rainier's over there somewhere. You see that cloud of bank of clouds? It's over there. You know what's funny is that almost every time I've been there, it's actually really super nice. Are you kidding me? Really good friend, best friend of mine lives in Seattle. We went for his birthday several years ago. His birthday's in January. <laughs> that was dark and gray and cool and rainy and whatever. But all the rest of the time, I mean, like when you go on vacation, when I go on vacation, I want to go to the place that I don't want to go during the crappy time. So we go during the summer, during the early, early fall when it's just perfect in the Pacific Northwest. It's always really beautiful. So I don't, I don't know what people complain about the rain all the time. Every time I'm there, it's Sunny and dry. It looks nice. Nick, my son is getting ready to move back there in uh, December. And I said, wow, what a great time to move there when it's <laughs> exactly it gets dark at two fifteen in the <laughs> afternoon and light at nine Oh five in the morning. It's going to be fantastic. Well, Gene Simmons is dark already. You know, he already is, seems like a moody kind of dude watching. Maybe Nick is going to move next door to Gene. So he could probably live in like the West wing or a portion of the, West wing of that house. Maybe. But the reason I want to talk about this isn't about Gene Simmons. Does that make sense? Moving from one state to another, especially when this whole piece OG is about how much he loves this house that he had. Does it make sense to leave the house you love? Yeah, it totally does. I mean, people look at the stuff that they have with such reverence and not as a tool to be used and change from time to time. You know, it's amazing to me, you know, you see, you see people who, who are in, you know, houses that are too big for them or the purchases of vehicles or whatever, you know, you just go, but this is the family home. It's like, come on, man, you don't need 4,000 square feet. You're, you're by yourself. Yeah, you know, but if you can, if you can afford it though, why not? I mean, if you love he's that place, that he's, he, he doesn't want to afford it anymore. He he's doesn't tired want to. Of, he's, he's tired of writing the check. Tired of the tax bill. I think there's other things that come with that, though. I mean, I know moving back to Texarkana, you know what one of the nicest things has been? We, Tex-Mex. We, t- correct. Second thing is those margaritas. Barbecue. Those margaritas down at Zapata's. Margaritas, yes. And then third, you're right, is uh, we're, we're headed to Naaman's Barbecue. Yeah, you and I have barbecue. had that this afternoon. But th- th- those don't even make the top. When we went to a event last week, the Texarkana Symphony Orchestra, we have a symphony orchestra. I walked in and the president of the board was standing there and uh, they were seating people around the church where they were performing. But he immediately saw me and he said, the Saul Seahys are back. I was told that you're coming back. We're so happy that you're back in town. I barely know this guy. I mean, I know him a little bit. But it was so weird that this town, it was just a really nice feeling, you know, having your friends. You've donated too much money to the symphony. (laughs) He's like. Or not enough because he, he barely knows you. We can get that second uh, cello, celloist, cellist, cello player. Cellist, I think. Yes. Like when it says you're, you're sponsoring the second chair, cellist. For you, they don't actually mean the person. They mean the chair. They mean the chair. I can't the afford the person. thing that they're sitting in. They're like, this folding chair was brought to you by the Saul Seahigh family. The Pearson seated in it is from Dr. Smith. <laughs> Came from Target. Uh, yes. Person seated in it. Benjamins. <laughs> We've sponsored four chairs at the symphony. It's incredible. Those four in the back that nobody sits in. But I think people, when they move, my point is, and I think you know my point, they, they don't think about your community, your friends, man, I didn't think about it enough. We moved to Michigan a couple of years ago, being back and having these people around me again. It's very nice. Super nice. Yeah. Back with your people. It's also nice to not pay taxes. So <laughs> good point. 
I think our takeaways here, number one is taxes versus community. That's pretty, that, he's, he must add a huge tax bill on this house. Just looking at, go to stackybenjamins.com, click on the show notes for today. Look at this house, everybody, because it is uh, crazy, crazy big. That's lesson number one. I think you got to weigh that carefully. But lesson number two, Bitcoin, still more to come. Still the wild, wild west. Well, I've mentioned this many times before. I am very interested in design and how things are packaged and designed, how they look, how cities are put together. I'm fascinated by all of these stories and there's so much money wrapped up in communities and how communities are created and how the upkeep happens. A lot of this appreciation though, I learned from our guest today, Roman Mars. He is the host of a podcast that is easily, easily one of my favorite podcasts. And he's a man I've learned so much about podcasting from Roman Mars on my dad shortwave radio. And on my dad's shortwave radio, the man who caused a city to change its flag. It's my new friend, Roman Mars. How are you, man? I'm doing great. It's good to be here. Is that how you like to be introduced as the guy who single-handedly helped Pocatello get its act together with its flag? <laughs> you know, it's not a bad claim to fame. I can I'll accept it. It's funny because I never thought about flags until listening to 99% Visible and, of course, reading the new book. But then I thought about it. I have the symbol of the city of Venice that I bought while we were in Venice, Roman, because it's such a badass symbol. And if if a flag like Pocatello's needs to be changed, I mean, it can only help. I totally agree. I mean, the main thing that I like about flags is people who use them and love them. The idea of the TED Talk of getting people to care about their flags is, is that a good design usually helps them care about their flags more. But if the city can rally behind anything and have a municipal symbol that we all own and can all share, and it's not a, a brand, it's not owned by a sports team, if it's really ours collectively, then that's just a great and beautiful thing. And, and any way we can get to people to do that is, is good in my book. Speaking of something that people call collectively theirs, uh, Cheryl, my spouse and I, Roman, just did a trip around the Salton Sea. I never mm-hmm. even knew the Salton Sea existed until I heard, I, I believe it's a 2015 story yeah. on your show about it. Have, have you actually been there? But I mean, these people really own that sea. They are, the number of people pleading for that sea to be saved is, is amazing. Yeah, no, that was Emmett Fitzgerald. He's a reporter producer on my show. And this is maybe one of the first few stories he ever did with us. And he went down there and checked it out. And it is an unusual place. (laughs) (laughs) It is a, you know, a place kind of created by an accident of irrigation. And this like little area that that constantly flooded, you know, for millennia, just as a natural, like kind of sink, like a place where water collected in a valley. And then it sort of gained uh, purchase by after some using the Central Valley for irrigation. And then all of a sudden, like uh, water stuck around and then never left. But now it is probably leaving in different ways because of drought and climate change and stuff like that. But there was a period of time where that place was going to be, it was called the California Riviera, where it was going to be like a really big deal and big stars came there and it was, you know, and and now it's in a much different state. What was it like when you were there? The amount of infrastructure that was in place, especially there was an area on the west side of the sea. It was a a checkerboard of roads and Mm -hmm. of power lines and these wonderful names that were all Riviera or, or Maui or, mm-hmm. or all these different tropical names and nothing. You could tell that somebody had invested a lot of money and created all this infrastructure. And by the time that this particular community was being created, I think nobody came. Yeah, it was gone. Yeah. It's a really strange place that's been abandoned. But it's also one of these weird things that's kind of natural and kind of human made. And no one knows quite what to do with it in the end. And is it worth saving the sea itself, even if there's no people around to be tourists for it? I mean, it's just it's a confusing and confounding place. And I mean, that's why we're interested in it. Like, we don't know if we we never have like an answer necessarily. We just like asking the questions. Yeah, the birds in the ecosystem that need that place. I'm very fascinated, Roman, about your background. How did you become a fan of the 99% Invisible? 
Well, I think I've always been, you know, a student and a, a type of person who likes interesting hidden stories in the, in the world. I studied biology for a really long time. That was sort of the way I accessed my curiosity for a while. And then I got into journalism and realized that I was studying like one thing in plant genetics for a really long time. But what I really loved was teaching and reading and understanding and, and maybe passing that along to other people. And I didn't realize that was journalism you know, for a long time, but I loved radio and I loved the sound of radio. I thought, well, I don't know what that job is, but there's somebody who works with the host to, you know, read the books, ask the questions. And I could, I think I could do a good job with that. And that's what made me look at radio. You didn't and think then, you were going to be the guy behind the mic. You were going to be the researcher. Absolutely. That, that was what I was good at. I was good at leading seminars. I was good at sort of laying things out for somebody. I had no sort of notion that I had the talent or the ability to talk on a microphone in front of people. I was uh, terrified of it. When did the idea then for 99% uh, Invisible actually come around? Were you walking down the street and you saw the... I, I have this feeling because I love the Montgomery Ward story personally. Yeah, yeah. Um, were you walking along, you saw this building, you said, oh my God, I have a show? Kind of. I mean, that's why I often talk about that when I talk live about that building in particular. So I had already been in radio for a while. I was I was living in Chicago. I was working at WBEZ in Chicago. I was on the architecture boat tour, and they point out the Montgomery Ward headquarters in the Montgomery Ward complex. That's on the north branch of the river when you do the riverboat tour. And the cool thing about this building, it is not a notable building in any respect. <laughs> like it is, you know, it's kind of a rectangle. It just, but one of the things that you do notice about it, it has these really thick concrete corner supports on the corner of the building. So like each of the four corners has this like big square of concrete. And the reason why I did was the Montgomery Ward company sort of prided itself on an egalitarian hierarchy. And they didn't want any of the vice presidents to fight over who got the corner office as a sort of <laughs> as a symbol of like who had the most powerful job. And so they made a building that had no possibility of a corner office whatsoever. I remember hearing that story and it made me like the building for the first time. I'd passed it all the time and never cared for it. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, there is something about the design of this that makes me love this building. And the other thing it made me do was think that, oh, I could probably tell a story like that without you seeing the building and have it still be a satisfying story. Because I'd never really quite thought of how you would do architecture on the radio before. In a way, that building was one of the reasons why I started this. And then, then I moved back to the Bay Area. I was working at KLW in San Francisco where my career started. And the AIA, the American Institute of Architects in San Francisco, had gotten in touch with KLW and said, you know, it'd be cool if we could sponsor like an architecture minute, you know, something about like a building in San Francisco and you could do a little short story on it. And Matt Martin, the GM of KLW, asked me, you know, what I thought of that. And I, I was totally excited about the idea. And that's kind of how the 99PI was born. As a money nerd and a design nerd, I've always thought that good design leads to more money. But good design, as you point out in your new book, Roman, just leads to a better experience, which I suppose is more money. But but I think yeah. it also is just a better life. I mean, you kick off the book by talking about some of the sexiness of the utilities uh, work on <laughs> sidewalks. I mean, yeah. what a what a great way to roll out design. Yeah, I mean, that... One of the things that we always knew, Kurt Kolstad and I, who co-authored the book, we always knew that we wanted to start the book with this story about utility codes because there are these spray painted markings that you see on streets and sidewalks and we pass them, we never really notice them, but a really there's a codified system of symbols and colors that is there to let people know when they're excavating or doing any work on the street, the types of pipes and conduits and, you know, and, and wires that are underneath the asphalt, you can decode them. And one of the reasons why it's particularly sort of notable is the reason why this all got formalized. You know, one of the major incidents was that in, in 1976 in Los Angeles on Venice Boulevard, a worker accidentally cut into a petroleum pipeline and it ignited a fireball. It killed and injured about two dozen people. It was a really major tragedy. And it made everyone kind of snap to attention and realize like we have to have a system that lets people know what's underneath the street because there's some dangerous stuff underneath there and there's a lot of it. And so now you can see it everywhere in a city. And it's one of the sort of first 
information layers that you can decode on your own wherever you are. And it's one of the things that sort of helps delight people when they like, oh yeah, and I understand the city a little bit better now because of it. And they're kind of messy and they're kind of weird, but they're super fun. But I totally agree with you. I mean, design, good design is a, you know, it leads to better money. I mean, nobody did this better than like the Apple Corporation, for example, which made design like the front of mind for a whole generation of consumers. And good design leads to a much better life in lots of different ways. Well, and sticking with sidewalks, you have you st- you stick with sidewalks for a long time. I, <laughs> I, I got the feeling the two of you have something going with sidewalks, but we won't yeah. get into that. <laughs> but, but you do talk about you know you can look at uh, the history of a city just by seeing who laid the sidewalk. I never yeah. thought about that yet. I've I I just remember being in major cities and looking down at the corner Roman and, and seeing these either little plaques or little things uh, markers about what street I'm on or Mm. who laid the sidewalk. That's all fascinating stuff that goes right over the head of 99.9% of the people out there. Yeah. I mean, in a lot of cities and I think in most places, it's a little less common than it was like a few decades ago. The construction company that did the work on the the house or whatever, um, they laid the sidewalk out in front of it and they often put a stamp on the edges of their area. So like you'll see one on basically on the right side of the house and one on the left side of the house and I'll have the construction company and it's a little form of advertising in Chicago for a long time it was actually required so that if something went wrong or they could find someone to blame you know for for it it's a biography of who built our city so much so that you can actually see like there's ones in in Berkeley California that have like a union number and like a person's union number like you know the person who's like you could go to the union office and look up like the person who got down on their knees and smoothed out that piece of concrete. And I think that stuff is just amazing. The windows into how things are made that are written right there for us to decode if we, if we choose to. I just love hearing the excitement in your voice as you talk, (laughs) as you talk about sidewalks. I'm not sure what your family thinks about that, but uh, I would love for you to tell another story that made me laugh. And that was a park in Australia where they have these uh, Cleopatra style obelisks And it just seems like this beautiful thing that a park would have and everybody celebrates. But this is really camouflage, a city turning something really ugly into something beautiful. Yeah. So this is in Sydney's Hyde Park in Australia. You know, this sort of dates back to the 1850s when, you know, sewage in those outlying areas were kind of new anyway. (laughs) And so there are lots of these like stink pipes to get the smell out of sewage. And what they decided to do was rather than, you know, kind of shunt it somewhere else, they put it where they needed to in in this park. And then they covered it with an obelisk, you know, like modeled after Cleopatra's needles. So it was unveiled in, in 1857. It's both like a, a monument and symbol that is inspiring, but it also has an extremely practical purpose, which is to vent the gases so that the sewage uh, doesn't uh, blow up. <laughs> I love these stories, Roman, because I feel like a bean counter somewhere lost, right? I can imagine <laughs> this this room and the bean counters going, we're going to pay for what? We're going to make this sewer thing an obelisk. That's crazy. Right. Well, there's these phases of this where infrastructure and really investing in the beauty of infrastructure and that being something that was a a huge value. You know, we've gone through phases of that. Like, you know, if you look at a period of time where we had lots of capital buildings were built in the Beaux-Arts style, which is that when you think of a capital, you know, with a gold dome, like a gold plated dome and all the busy filigree and ornamentation and stuff, that's called Beaux-Arts. And there was a period of time where we thought, Government deserves a sort of type of respect, and it needs to be presented as such as a place where that is our our collective will creates this place that is beautiful and we work for people. And then there was a period of time where we like where modern capital and, and federal buildings were all like in a brutalist style where it's like big, chunky, it's very utilitarian. It's a very ominous, you know, like, and there was a notion that there's no, we have no time for that sort of like busy fussiness and fanciness. We're here to do work. We're here to do business and we're here to count beans. And I don't have a lot of judgment as to which is better. Like I actually like a brutalist style a ton, like in modernist styles uh, quite a bit. 
but it's more just like as a window into how we feel about the things we build and how they should reflect our values is fascinating to me. That's what I like using the built environment for. It's like just to sort of like it's a window into like, oh yeah, in the 70s, we really thought of government this way, you know, versus in the 20s, we thought of government this way. And I think that's super fascinating. A lot of the stories that we, you and I have talked about uh, so far are from early in the book and the section on camouflage and how we take yeah. these things and we camouflage them. As I'm reading along, Roman, I have to tell you, I'm thinking, how come he's not talking about these cell phone towers? As I'm driving along, I see this <laughs> one tree that's hella bigger than all the other trees. It's very obvious this is yeah. not a tree. This is just a cell phone tower. I literally turn the page and you have a whole section about cell phone towers. <laughs> and cell phone towers, yep, yep. My favorite fact about cell phone towers is just their name, is that they're named because the coverage area of a cell phone tower looks like a cell on a petri dish when it grows all together so it's like that's what the word cell comes from and then the other part of it that i find kind of fascinating is the other sort of natural analog is this you know like as soon as they started proliferating all over the u.s in particular there was a community sort of desire to like well let's cover some of these things up <laughs> because they're ugly and they they do it kind of awkwardly a lot of the times you know there's a you know, if you notice a very straight, tall, um, extremely sparse pine tree, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's likely a cell phone tower and some of them look good. Some of them look like really not so good, but they're fascinating to find regardless. Well, one more story I would love to, for you to share from the book is I'm a big baseball fan, Roman, and I'm sure yeah. many of our fans are. Yeah. There is this idea of Thomasons later in the book. Yeah. Yeah. And if you remember the story about Thomasons and what that has to do with the fabric of a city, I'd love for you to tell that story. Oh, absolutely. So Thomasons, this is one of my favorite stories that we've ever done in the history of the show. This was like a story first reported in our show by Avery Truffleman. And it's based on this idea that there was an artist in Japan called Akasagawa Genpei. And he was out on a walk with his friends and he discovered this a set of stairs that, you know, it was like three or four stairs up and then a landing and three or four stairs down. And where that landing was and where there should be like a door or something to get into that building, there was no door. And so he was fascinated by this sort of leftover object that served no purpose anymore. But what really, really got his attention was that the railing on this set of stairs that went nowhere had recently been painted and made more beautiful. And he was like, the idea that you would spend time to maintain and upkeep a useless object. He really just thought of it like this is art in a city. This is what a city is. It's like this vestigial things that we maintain is art. And he was trying to come up with a name for them. And at the time, <laughs> there was this baseball player named Gary Thomason. A good, good baseball player, played the major leagues here for over a decade. And by the end of his career, he had actually been, he took a job in Japan playing baseball. And whereas he, he did well here, he did not do well in Japan. He led the strikeout record in his, in the league. He was a very expensive acquisition, but he he did not do well. And he sat on the bench. And and so Akasagawa Genpei like, took this idea of him being kind of a vestigial, useless object who sat on the bench, but paid a lot of money. And so he took that concept and he said, well, then these things are like Thomasons, like Gary Thomason. <laughs> And so he called them Thomasons and people all over the world began to send in, you know, pictures of Thomasons in their neighborhood and, and then he would rate them and they would discuss them. And he had this sort of photographic zine that he, that he curated. And then a book eventually came out. And I've been fascinated by these things because they're really fun to find like things that are, and the, the key is that not just vestigial, there's lots of vestigial, like useless objects that are like little exposed pipes that come out that don't do anything. The key is that they're both useless and maintained, like useless and done something with. Those are Thomasons. And they're, if you keep an eye out for those as you walk around the city, your day is filled with delight, like a scavenger hunt. It's like rare enough that it's fun and challenging, but like frequent enough that you can definitely find them. And and so it, go searching for Thomasons in your city. They're, they're super fun. I don't know if I'm Gary Thomason, if I feel appreciated or if I'm horrified. Yeah. You know, we get into that because Akasagawa Gempe, he was like a fan of the Yumiori Giants who Gary Thomason was part of. And he didn't really want to insult him. He felt really kind of bad for it. Like when it was translated into English, his, his some of his work he was really nervous about it but he was like but he kept on sort of saying just like i have so much respect for him i really didn't mean it to be bad it, these things are delightful these things are you know i'm just trying to make a statement and i hope they would take it well but the family would take it well but you know you never know 
The book is 99% Invisible City. So for our design nerds and money nerds, there's so many intersections in this book between money and design. I'm assuming, Roman, it's available everywhere. It's available anywhere. <laughs> I mean, if you can get it from our website at 99pi.org slash book, it has all the links to like your Indie Bounds and your Amazons and your Barnes & Noble and the audiobook. You, that's the, probably the best place to send people. And I will link to that on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. And I'll also link to a few of the episodes of 99PI that we talked about here on the show. Roman, thanks a ton for talking design with us for a few minutes here. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's been a blast. I appreciate your interest. Hey, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I I'm over here. I'm over here. And all this talk about 99% invisible cities got me thinking. Let's get right to your trivia question. What city does travel site thecultureTrip.com call the most walkable city for tourists in the world? Bonus points if you can identify the most walkable city in the USA also. Huh. I wonder if it's Texarkana. Well, do you use credit cards responsibly? Me? No. <laughs> never, never, never in a, mil in a million years. Well... This isn't for you then, OG, but for all of our responsible stackers out there, you want to hear something amazing? Discover matches all the cash back you earn on your credit card at the end of your first year automatically with no limit on how much you can earn. How amazing is that? In fact, it's even more amazing because of all the places where Discover's accepted. In fact, it's even more amazing because of all the places Discover's accepted, 99% of places in the U.S. that take credit cards. So when it comes to Discover, get used to hearing yes more often. Learn more at discover.com slash yes. 2020 Nielsen Report. Limitations apply. Something else to do responsibly, OG, is to manage your team responsibly. Even though OG and I are sitting here in mom's basement with Doug over in the corner. I shouldn't have even said that. Aren't we pretending he doesn't exist today? Pretending who doesn't exist. <laughs> there you go. It does take an entire team to produce this podcast. Gertrude lives across town. Karen, who helped make sure that Roman Mars uh, got to talk to us today. Karen is in Montana. Taylor, who does a lot of writing for us, is in Phoenix. Steve, who puts the show together, is in St. Louis. It takes a lot of us. Richie's in Nevada. Is that the place where I'm supposed to crack a Nevada joke or was that so last week? Exactly. I was thinking of the same thing. I'm like, can I? Uh, no. <laughs> we'll stay away from the Nevada joke, but you can see that we're all over the place. And when it comes to work and financial management, by the way, what do they have in common? Well, money, obviously, but you actually have to master the same skills, organization, goal setting, planning, and staying on track. Monday.com is what we use. It's an easy to use, flexible, and visual online platform designed to manage any team organization or process online, making sure every aspect of work is organized and on track. I got to tell you, we just switched over to monday.com and we had five different systems that we use to make the show, putting them all in one OG. Yeah. Super easy. Going from five to one. And by the way, two of those systems have separate subscriptions. So we're going from two subscriptions to just one simple subscription with monday.com. It's easy to use. It's flexible. It's a visual online, pla very visual online platform designed to manage any team organization or process online. It's suitable for any size team, a team of eight like ours to 5,000 people collaborating, collaborating across the globe, the globe. I don't know if you've ever collaborated across the globe before. But, but you could do that. How, how only, if, only after I've had three bottles of wine. <laughs> when you started using monday.com with your team, was there, were there three of you at that time? Yeah, it might've been two and then quickly added three. And it's really for us just such a perfect, a perfect way to help manage process. It's great. What I like about it is all the, if then automations, once one thing gets done automatically, that steps up the next thing that needs to be done. So the process right. is always continuing and all that you and I have to do with monday.com is look at the dashboard and we can see by based on color where everything is and who's got the ball. It's, it's interesting. There's ready to go templates for any use case, built in solutions for your industry workflow. We also have had a uh, meeting with Eddie. Eddie's an awesome trainer at monday.com helps us set it up. Uh, both Gertrude and Karen have gone to webinars. They have so many ways to help you use this robust tool 
When your teamwork is effective, nothing can stop you to start your free 14 day trial. Go to monday.com free 14 day trial head to monday.com. Hey there stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm back ignoring these guys pretending I'm invisible. Yeah, right. Like you can't hear this incredible voice. Nice try boys. Okay. Uh, Well, to prove there's one adult in the room, here's your trivia answer. Question was, what city does travel site theculturetrip.com call the most walkable city for tourists in the world? While New York City scored number two on that list, it was actually Florence, Italy that they call the most walkable. Ah, Florence. The town with the Eiffel Tower, the Rocky Mountains in the background. I remember it well. In case you're wondering about the other three, I'll throw those into the show notes for no additional charge. See ya! Big thanks to Roman Mars for stopping by. You're so awestruck still, huh? I just think all these money stories are great, man. Don't you think that Doug's the Thomason of our our show? Yes. (laughs) Well cared for. Right. The nature of design and how things are designed, I don't think will ever stop amazing me. I could hear all the 99% visible stories and, uh, and I'll still want more. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. Not seeing Doug. And or pretending not to see him. And uh, good looking design. It's actually your loved ones and your time. They have written here, but I tend to like ours better. It's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. So you can spend more time thinking about design or ignoring Doug. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get your free quote. It's a simple application. It's online, instant coverage decision. And I can't, I can't, I can't overemphasize the fact that it's a simple application is not the norm in the insurance world. Stackybedjamins.com forward slash Haven Life to get your insurance done now. Today, we're going to throw out the Haven Lifeline to our new friend, August. Say hi, August. Hi, Joe and OG. My name is August. I wanted to let you know I found the other listener. He's a trucker just like me. We must get really bored if we listen to this show. Anyhow, his name is Pitos. Shout out to Pitos. If I understand this right, my Roth 401k at work can be rolled over in one lump sum into my Roth IRA once I retire. I've already started the clock on my IRA with $500. I intend on maxing out my Roth 401k at work in my Roth IRA eventually. At this point, I'm trying to build my emergency fund and save for a house. For this question, forget about the whole you need to have different buckets tax deferred and stuff. I know. So for the time being, if I just wanted to invest a little bit more than my match, say $6,000 more over the next year, is there any reason I would want to put that in my Roth IRA versus my Roth 401k, since I can roll it over in the end anyhow? And if I retired early, would I wish I would have done one over the other? Oh, gee, your answer probably doesn't matter anyway, because I think expense ratios are high right now, and I like to invest in one index fund for simplicity. And my work doesn't offer that fund at this time. Therefore, I'm not going to contribute in protest. I'm 25, <laughs> so I'm pretty sure that makes my shirt size like a 25T. Thanks. <laughs> you know, people always ask me what career I would like. I just, I love road trips, man. And uh, being a trucker, I've got a lot of respect for those guys. Your dad was a trucker, right? Yeah, yeah, truck driver. Yeah, as, my, as was my grandfather. My uncle drives a truck. As well. In fact, grandpa was awarded Michigan trucker of the year by the governor. I didn't. How is there such a, how is there, is there such a thing? Is it, did he use his turn signal all the time correctly or. I see what you're doing, but I will tell you that the reason is, is because he had uh, successfully completed 43 years. Holy. Without a single incident. That that's impressive. Yeah. I mean, considering how many times you wreck your car just on a (laughs) monthly basis. Not, not me, but my son likes to mount the car on mailboxes. He does. That's a story that we'll share with new listeners on another day. Maybe. I actually whipped out the uh, rocket driver today. 
with Mrs. OG. I said, I said, it doesn't take a rocket driver. And she just laughed. She goes, what's a rocket driver? I said, come <laughs> on now. That's a funny stacking Benjamin story it's another. Uh, from Joe. And I told her, she goes, oh, yeah, that's right. Someday we're going to have to start recycling some of the, get people caught up, not recycle. Let's get people caught like up. A, like a bullet point list of this is what, you know. Yes. We have to tell the Steak Brothers story. When we talk about Steak Brother, what are we talking about? Yeah. Yes. When we talk about every time I order a port at a restaurant, all my friends go, Porto, P- Portugal. It's just, it's, it's not good. Mm. You're yeah. looking at me like you don't even remember that one. I don't know that one. No, no. That's another day. All right. So let's get to this. First of all, let's talk about one concept that August talked about, by the way, thanks for the question, August. He talked about starting the clock on his Roth. And this is, this is an important concept. I think OG that a lot of people don't know about Roth IRAs. Talk for a second about what that means. Starting the clock. Well, in order to take the money out of your Roth that you've contributed because you can do that, you can take your contributions out without paying taxes on it. In order to do that, you have to have had that account open for five years. So the earlier you start that five years, the better. You know, when you open the account, put a dollar in it, or in August's case, he put $500 in it, I think he said. You know, that starts that five-year clock. So if he needs the money for whatever reason, before retirement, he's able to take his contributions out, not the gains and not the growth, but he can take his contributions out. And you can do that if it's been greater than greater than five years. Which is why he is okay with using money in a Roth IRA as his reserve. And by the way, I don't have a problem with that if you don't have the money to do both. And if you can get at the money in your Roth fairly quickly, leave it in a cash position, but have it inside of the Roth. And then when you have enough money to build the actual emergency fund outside the Roth, you can then move that money into the appropriate place. Probably not one fun, August. Um, <laughs> probably not that. But let's talk about the rest of his question. Does it make sense to do one or the other? Roth 401k versus Roth IRA? No, I don't think it matters. He was The, the other thing that he mentioned was t- taking some time to uh, save for a down payment on a house. And if that's a priority, I mean, obviously the extra retirement savings would go to the back of the line if you're trying to make sure you've got enough cash set aside for, for a down payment. So, you know, focus on that as well. But if that's done or that's on track and you still have money left over, uh, it's really kind of tomato, tomato, because the only place where you're going to get into which one is better is once you get one of those things filled up. So you, let's say that, you know, fast forward a few years and now you're making more money and, you know, you can save more. And now you're at 19.5 in your workplace plan. You go, and now I still have 6,000. What do I do with it? Well, now you can go back to the Roth, you know, so, so you can. I mean, if, if your income allows it, both, both from a tax standpoint and also from a cash flow standpoint, you put $25,000 into tax-free buckets every year, not including an HSA, which would be like another... 3,500 or 7,000, depending if you're single or married. So, I mean, there's a lot of places to stuff money tax-free before you need to worry about like, and then what do I do? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Great question, August. Thank you for that question. And if you've got a question for us, love the Roth IRA question, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And that, that will lead you to this amazing page where you just click one button. And if your device has a microphone, like your phone does, you just leave your message there. And uh, OG and I and the team will answer it. Stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. All right. That's going to do it for today. I can smell the chili cooking. I'm so. Can you smell what the chili is cooking? Oh, that's the rock. Forget it. (laughs) Uh, mom's upstairs making that. This is when you really pretend that Doug is 99% invisible, but he'll make sure that he's visible here. All right. That's going to do it for today. Doug, you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headlines. Money is nice, but riding your bike in the appropriate place and having the right insurances in place are also helpful. Second, take a lesson from Roman Mars. Those little things around you in your community, always read the plaque and you'll have a better appreciation for your community and there's absolutely no charge to enjoy the little things. But the big takeaway...
Turns out Florence, Italy, isn't anywhere near the Rocky Mountains. My bad. I do remember Florence, though. St. Paul's Cathedral and the Westminster Abbey. So beautiful. Special thanks to Roman Mars for joining Joe today. You can check out Roman's podcast, 99% Invisible. We will also have a link to his book, The 99% Invisible City, a field guide to the hidden world of everyday design, on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is created by Joe Saul Seahigh, produced by Taylor Stevens, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm a lot deeper than you realize. In fact, sometimes I just stand in front of my mirror and reflect. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. And thanks to everyone who joined us last night on YouTube for The Stack. We had a great time. You showed me this clip for this uh, for this new movie coming out next week. So excited! I mean, when was the last time you went and saw a really good movie? That, that, well, and one that's probably up for an Academy Award. Well, I mean, you know, I, you might not have to go that far, but it's new and it has explosions. Just here is a movie called "What's This Movie Called?" OG Fat Man, starring my hero and yours, Mel Gibson. Oh God. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I've lost my influence. Maybe it's time I retired the coat. You still have it. Some kids with a deer rifle put two holes in the sleigh, one in me. All I have is a loathing for a world that's forgotten. The United States military would like to procure your services. This is a one-time deal, gentlemen. How are you, Mike? Nicole and the kids are well, I hope. Who are you? You just lost a big son! Stop me! What's the job? I'd like you to kill Santa Claus. <laughs> And the only thing you can't see there, everybody heard everything I think that was important there, except for the fact that this kid gets his present, he's all excited, and there's a piece of coal in his uh, in his present. And then he's got to go kill Santa Claus, because that's what you do when you get coal. Well, he apparently hires somebody to kill Santa Claus. <laughs> I have no idea anything about this story, but it looks awesome. I just love whoever's mind thought this up. Like, what if we put a hit out on Santa Claus? So good. Might as well. I mean, with everything else going on. I just got to go into that realm for a while. I'm going to see it the first day it comes out. How about you? You're going to be seeing it front row. Well, no, you'll get that middle seat in the theater. Well, it only comes out on Netflix, so... Middle seat at home. I will be in the middle seat of my couch. Right. You're like, kids, move over. 
It's daddy's movie.